Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I mentioned this is joint work with Adam Marcus. I was telling you a little about his company. I believe he finally will be leaving this company and taking an academic job this year. And with Nikhil Srivastava, oh, I should say he's moving to Berkeley from Microsoft Research. Okay, so I hope that pretty much everyone here is sort of aware of Ramanujan graphs, but I'm going to make this self-contained. So if you're not, I'll tell you a little about them anyway. So first, let me tell you about expander graphs, of which Ramanujan graphs are in some sense the best. So expander graphs are very sparse graphs, usually. So you should think of every node as having constant degree, like three or five, independent of the number of vertices. And <clears throat> to me and a lot of people, they look like sort of pseudo-random graphs. They have a lot of properties in common with random graphs if they were sparse. Um, in particular, random walks on them mix quickly, sort of as quickly as possible. And we call them expanders because every small set of vertices has a very large number of neighbors. So boundaries are always large of every set, you know, nearly as large as can be. We use them a huge amount within theoretical computer science and engineering. So, I mean, they are, they're everywhere. So the, the standard applications people will know is we use them to make pseudo-random generators, we use them to make error-correcting codes. I talked about them as sparse approximations of complete graphs, and this gives us a lot of algorithmic tools to make fast algorithms. But more than that, many of the major theorems in theoretical computer science would not be possible without expander graphs. Or the way I describe it, when I was in graduate school, you were a defective graduate student if you didn't at least have some familiarity with expander graphs. It's because you just had to know that these could solve many, many problems. Not only that, they are very, very important examples. Whenever you're trying to prove a theorem about graphs, you know, you check it on the first few graphs you know. You check it on a path, you check it on a tree, you check it on a grid. You, you gotta check it on expanders too. They're really fundamental examples. Okay, that's the hype. Let's do some definitions. So th the way we will define expanders for today is by looking at the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix of the graph. So for example, for this graph here, uh, I should have labeled my vertices probably one through five because A corresponds to column one and row one in this matrix and so E corresponds to row five and column five. The adjacency matrix of a graph has a one in the off diagonals corresponding to an edge. So this one corresponds to the edge between A and B. And they're symmetric. Okay, when we want to understand a graph, we will look at the eigenvalues of its adjacency matrix. And I will always order these from lambda one being the largest down to lambda n if I have n vertices. So we will, for most of this talk, be considering regular graphs, where every vertex has the same number of attached edges. In regular graphs, we, the, gr the degree will be the number of edges. It'll be d. So if every vertex has d edges, then lambda 1 is always going to be d. That is because if you take the all ones vector and multiply it by this matrix, if there are d ones in every single row, you'll get the d times the all ones vector out. OK, for that reason, this eigenvalue is not that interesting. It's telling you something very crude about the graph, that every single vertex has degree d. So we will think of that eigenvalue lambda 1 when it's equal to d for a deregular graph as being trivial. It's not telling us much. It's just a property of being deregular. <clears throat> we're mainly going to be looking at bipartite graphs. So these are graphs where you can divide the vertices into two sets and all the edges go between one set and the other. It's very easy to see that when you have a bipartite graph, its eigenvalues are symmetric about the origin. The way to see this is look at the adjacency matrix and you'll see that the adjacency matrix has a block of zeros. If I order the vertices right with one side first and the other, I get two blocks of zeros in the upper left and lower right and then I get the adjacent sort of a matrix here, and it's transpose. And you can see then that the eigenvalues of such a matrix are symmetric about the origin. This means that if I have a bipartite deregular graph, it'll also have a smallest eigenvalue of minus d. And that will just be a consequence of being deregular and bipartite. So we'll also think of that as a trivial eigenvalue. It's not telling us that much, <clears throat> but we need it there. Okay, now I can give you the spectral definition of expanders. We're at close. Basically, we say G is a good expander if all of the non-trivial eigenvalues are close to zero. So think of having the real line here. All the eigenvalues will be between D and minus D. 
we want all of the ones other than the trivial ones to be close to zero. And many of the properties and things you want to know about expanders just follow from this. And sort of the closer they are to zero, the better an expander it is, at least spectrally speaking. So for example, take a look at the complete bipartite graph. This is a graph where every, you have every possible edge between two sides. This is a great expander. Because you know it has an eigenvalue of d, and has an eigenvalue of minus d. But if you look at the adjacency matrix, you see it's a rank 2 matrix. So all the other eigenvalues are 0. So finding you know, a great expander like this is, is easy. The harder problem is finding families that are good expanders for a fixed degree and having the number of vertices grow. Here my number of vertices is twice the degree. Uh, you can also show just that the complete graph in the non-bipartite case is a great expander. All the eigenvalues other than the trivial one will be near zero. Okay, so I said the challenge is to construct infinite families of graphs, or the main challenge of fixed degree, that are all good expanders. These are something that computer scientists were looking for for a long time. And you can ask, how well can you do? Well, there's a bound usually attributed to Alone and Bapana, which says that the best you can do is 2 square root d minus 1. By which I mean, if there is some, if you tried to prove any bound stronger than this, if I tried to move this down a little bit and I took a large enough d regular graph, it would have an eigenvalue, or the eigenvalues will always approach 2 root d minus 1. You can't push anything better than that. So we call this the alone Bapana bound. So Lubotsky, Phillips, and Sarnak coined the name of Ramanujan graph. So that a graph is a Ramanujan graph if all of the non-trivial eigenvalues actually have absolute value at most 2 root d minus 1. So they do, Ramanujan graphs, in this sense, are the best possible spectral, spectrally speaking, the best possible expanders. They are graphs where the eigenvalues exactly meet the bound that we know it is impossible to do any better. And you can imagine then that for many, many applications, these are really the, where you want expanders. Even more than wanting expander, you want these. These are usually the best of them. And they coined this term because they built them. So in one of the greatest gifts from mathematics to computer science, they gave us infinite families, of uh, infinite sequences of graphs that were Ramanujan for degrees. Um, they did uh, the degree being 1 plus a prime, and then this was generalized to prime powers plus 1. But for every degree D, they gave us infinite families of these. Now, people also suspect that random graphs may very well be Ramanujan with reasonable probability. And Friedman proved something very close to this. He proved that if you take random d regular graphs that are big enough, they are almost Ramanujan. So for any epsilon you want, the eigenvalues will have absolute value at most 2 root d minus 1 plus epsilon, almost surely. So we know we can get very close to this by random graphs. But actually, you would think, OK, if random graphs are so close to this, why do I want these fancy constructions using number theory? Well, the answer is the explicit Ramanujan graphs are better because, as, than the random graphs because also they can be constructed explicitly, quickly, and you never actually fail to generate one. They work. And when I say explicitly, what I mean is if you tell me the name of a vertex in a graph, which in their case it's uh, something in a Cayley graph, in time polynomial in the length of the name, you can compute its neighbors. Actually, nearly linear in the length. It's, it's a very, very fast thing. So, this is a, so they are very, very explicit. And this is actually necessary for a lot of the applications that we have of expander graphs. So we can't, you know, while we can use random graphs, we just, you know, for some things, you can't always get away with them. The reason is sometimes you are reasoning about a graph that is insanely large compared to the actual. You never actually want to write down the whole graph. You want to just do, say, a random walk on it. OK, so what I am going to tell you about today is a solution of a conjecture. I think Lubotsky was the first one I know to state it, uh, to prove that at least there are infinite families of okay, bipartite, bipartite Ramanujan graphs of every degree. So, we know, so in some sense, we now know that Ramanujan graphs are not a fact about number theory. We don't need the degree to be a prime power plus 1. 
For every single degree, we will now know that there are infinite families of Ramanujan graphs. I should give you the caveat that these are even less useful than the random graphs. This is an existence theorem, but we do not have any reasonable algorithm for computing these. And I, I can explain why you like Well, you know, someone may come up with one, but our proof does not translate into any reasonable algorithm for computing them. Though it is an algorithm, it's exponential time in the size of the graph, so it would be, <clears throat> we wouldn't want to use it. Okay, but we can do more than that. So we're going to get you other types of Ramanujan graphs. So one thing you can ask yourself when you're taking a look at a bipartite graph is what if I don't want it to be regular? What if I want every node on one side to have degree 3 and every node on the other side to have degree 6? This is a family very close to my heart because they show up in constructions of error correcting codes. Or if I want a, we call it a biregular graph where all of the nodes on one side have degree C and all the nodes on the other side have degree D. Okay, so in this case, we can also construct infinite families of Ramanujan graphs of this type, where the analog of the alone Bapana bound is that the non-trivial eigenvalues can at most hit root D minus 1 plus root C minus 1. And by the same proof I'll give you for the regular case, it's a very simple translation. One slide at the end tells you you can do this as well. And I don't think we had any explicit constructions of anything like this before. Oh. Oh, okay. At least he hasn't very mentioned it to me when I talk to him about it. Very oh, for very special degrees. No, no, no. Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay. Oh, okay. I had not seen that. He should have told me about that. I talked to him about this <laughs> just a few months ago. And he saw my slides. But anyway, he may, maybe he forgot and you remember. Okay. So let me tell you how we're going to go about this. We're going to follow an approach suggested by Ballou and Lineal. So the way to think about it is they want to say, let's say we have a Ramanujan graph. Like the complete bipartite graph and the complete graphs are Ramanujan. They're just small. So you want to increase its size. So this is, can we find an operation that will say double the size of the graph without creating any new large eigenvalues. So think about it. I take the graph, I make it bigger, I get some new eigenvalues, but I want them all to stay within the Ramanujan bound. So they proposed a way of doing this, looking at a two-lift of a graph. So I'll tell you what a two-lift is. You start out with a graph. We're now going to copy it. We will double every vertex and double every edge. To keep track of which is which, let me give them different names. So we'll call the vertices, say, instead of A, we'll make them A0 and A1. Okay, so so far I just have two disjoint copies of the graph. What we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, there's certain pairs of edges which are parallel, like this edge and this edge are really two copies of the same thing. We're going to, instead of have them sit like this, we're going to allow them to cross. So we will, the family of two lifts, it's a family of graphs with twice as many vertices, where for every pair of edges you either decide to keep them as they were or you decide to make them cross like this. And this gets you a family of graphs in which you can look and hope that one of them, is, these two lifts, is good. So if you want to see this first, you know, some people think about graphs, some people think about matrices. If you want to see what this means in the matrix, here is the adjacency matrix of my graph. Here is the adjacency matrix um, of the two disjoint copies of the graph. So I have all zero blocks over here and over here. What you're doing when you're taking the two lift is you are moving some entries from the diagonal blocks to the off diagonal blocks, like this. <clears throat> okay, so it turns out there is a very easy way to understand what are the eigenvalues of a two lift of a graph. So the way they understand them is they create, to describe the two lift, they take the adjacency matrix of the original graph and they now put signs on the edges. They put either a 1 or a minus 1. And this is how they're going to describe the two lifts. So when the edges cross, like here my a0 to b1, they'll put a minus 1 for that. The edges that remain parallel, the way they were, they'll keep a 1. So that 1 here should correspond to, ah, yeah, a to e. I kept the edges where they were. We didn't make them cross. So they form this signed adjacency matrix. And they prove, and it's pretty simple, that the eigenvalues of the two lift are the eigenvalues of the original graph 
So actually, all the eigenvalues of the original graph show up, union with the eigenvalues of this signed adjacency matrix. So this gives us a very simple way of understanding what are the eigenvalues of a two rift. I can make this signed adjacency matrix, and really now what I just need is I need that this signed adjacency matrix does not have any big eigenvalues. <clears throat> I need its eigenvalues to be small, and then I will make a good expander. Okay, so yes? Uh, actually, so I am going to eventually be bipartite, but that example was not because it's hard. Yeah, I wanted to make a reasonable size graph. Yes. Okay, so the conjecture of blue and lineal, and the blue and lineal's conjecture was not about bipartite graphs. Yes. Oh, no, yeah, oh, no, it doesn't have to be bipartite to do this. In my theorem, it does. Well, okay, there's a version of my theorem which doesn't, as you'll see. But yeah, we basically do. So they conjectured that every deregular graph has a two-lift in which all of the eigenvalues of absolute value at most two root d minus one. So they're saying this statement, regardless of the graph you start with, at least the new eigenvalues you introduce will not violate the alone Bopana bound, as long as, well, for some two lift. That was their conjecture. We will almost prove this. But first let me point out, and what they observe is this would give us infinite families of Ramanujan graphs of every degree. Because you would start with something that's a Ramanujan graph, like the complete graph, or the complete bipartite graph. And all the eigenvalues of that satisfy the alone on a bound. And then they'd prove there exists a lift, or the conjecture there exists a lift, which doesn't introduce any eigenvalues that violate that. And now you've got twice as many vertices, in the same degree. And you keep iterating this procedure, and you would get bigger and bigger graphs, all of the same degree, that satisfy the alone on a bound. And they'd be Ramanujan graphs. So this was their vision. And I'll tell you, as I suggested before, we're going to prove this in the bipartite case. And there's one thing I should have made a picture for, but I should tell you. At least it's worth knowing that every two-lift of a bipartite graph is bipartite. So when we take the two-lifts, we're not leaving the family of bipartite graphs. And it's exactly the bipartition you would expect. It's sort of the lift of the partition. OK, so what is special about bipartite graphs? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, this does almost fulfill their dream, right, at least in the, for the bipartite. No, no, oh, you mean, oh, they, they did. Oh, yeah, right, there is a, yeah, there's a slide about that, too, in a moment. Yes. So what we prove is not that there is a two-lift in which all the eigenvalues have absolute value at most two root d minus one. We prove that there is always a two-lift in which at least all the eigenvalues have value at most two root d minus one. We can bound the largest eigenvalue, but not the smallest. Well, OK, or I could do the smallest, but not the largest. I could do either end. But then we remember that in bipartite graphs, the eigenvalues are symmetric about the origin. So we cheat. In a bipartite graph, as soon as I've bounded the largest eigenvalue of a two-lift, I've also bounded the smallest, just because they're symmetric about the origin. So that enables us to say that at least in every deregular bipartite graph, it has a two-lift in which all of the new eigenvalues have absolute value at most two root d minus one. And that is how we will get, by proving this theorem, this is how we will get infinite families of Ramanujan graphs of every degree. OK, so let's think about how we'd prove it. Their first suggestion, and what they analyze in their paper some, is looking at a random two-lift. OK, so if you want to look at a random two-lift, a way of specifying is just record the sign for every single edge, whether or not they switch. So for every single edge, m is my number of edges, we'll pick each m to be plus one or each edge to get a plus one or minus one, and we'll do this independently. So we'll pick a signing uniformly at random for every edge. Now, this does not always work, and you can make graphs on which this fails almost always. So, and that's one of the reasons it's hard to prove that something good exists, it's because sometimes this fails. The main example of where this usually fails is if I have many, many small graphs and I have disjoint copies of them. So let's say I take the five clique, it's a four regular graph. Just take a lot of them, stick them together, and call them one graph, but don't put any edges between them. In this case, probably it fails, because your eigenvalues that you get are just the disjoint union of the eigenvalues you get from lifting this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. And if there's some probability that you fail on any one of them, once you make enough of them, you probably fail. 
OK, so a random lift, at least for things like this, is bad. But they said, you know, this is not the case we are interested in. We are interested in looking at lifts of Ramanujan graphs, which not only are not disconnected, they're really about as connected as you can get, especially spectrally speaking. OK, so they do prove that if your original graph G is almost Ramanujan, then all of the new eigenvalues you get are also very small. I won't give the exact number. But they basically say, if you have an expander, then your new eigenvalues get you close to being an expander. It's not enough to get to the Ramanujan bound, but it is at least a, a darn good start towards it. I mean, also it left room for improvement. So Duran Puder improved their bound, and also there's a recent improvement by Agarwar, Kola, and Madan. So we can say at least that if your graph is a good expander, it doesn't look like the bad case I showed you before, then random two lifts get you pretty close to the Ramanujan bound. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it depends on, yeah, how, right, there's a trade off between how small and how almost you have. But if you have yeah. a log d factor right. next to the square of g, then it's maintained. Uh, yes, right, right, so you can maintain, yes, you can get infinite families this way. They're still good expanders. Okay, so we're going to do something a little different. We know that, well, okay, we, I, I have no idea how to prove that a random lift would usually work, but I'm going to do something different. I just want to show existence. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the expected characteristic I polynomial. Think. Yes, which? Oh, of the random lift of a Ramanujan graph. OK. I did some experiments that seemed to agree with this, but it was only one plane flight worth of experiments. Um, uh, no, they were on thousands of vertices. So not big. That's moderate. Thousands of vertices, I can compute the eigenvalues in you know, less than a second on my laptop. So yeah, I could do many experiments on the plane flight. But um, I personally, OK, so uh, those who work with me routinely get emails about com the results of computer experiments. And the emails say, yes, it survived. You know, This conjecture survived 1,000 experiments or a million experiments. And then a month or two later, they get an email saying it survived a billion experiments. Or it got a counterexample. And, there are many things which you know, have survived a million, but not a billion. So I, I, I'm not attached to my experiments yet. It was only one plane flight. So. <laughs> but it made me think it was at least reasonable. But yeah, we can. <coughs> what we should? Oh, OK. Uh, I don't think they were saying random. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. Yes, that there exists one. But we should, yeah, I should do that again and check. So I, oddly enough, this, paper, this is actually one of my only papers that I did not do a lot of experiments for because we proved the theorems too quickly and it wasn't necessary. And I, I will explain why at the end of the talk. So, but uh, yes, so, so we, we didn't do the experiments to do this. When you look yes. at the, uh -huh. you see a log, log, log? No, here they were actually, I was taking Ramanujan graphs and lifting them and I was getting Ramanujan graphs pretty darn often. I don't know if Duron, if you've done experiments on this to try it out or. OK, yeah, I was choosing random two lifts. OK, so let me tell you what we're going to do with the expected characteristic polynomial. And this, for some of you, most of you were here for my talk yesterday. This will be a little bit of a repeat, but I also promise to be self contained. So I'll cover some material again. I hope it's at least enjoyable enough you won't mind seeing it again. The outline of my argument is we prove that the maximum root of the expected characteristic polynomial is at most 2 root d minus 1. That is the bound that we want. We prove that this characteristic polynomials of which we are taking the average is something we call an interlacing family. And then those two facts enable us to conclude that there is a particular polynomial in my family, which means there is a particular two lift. So that the maximum root of the characteristic polynomial is at most 2 root d minus 1. And that gets all my eigenvalues to work out. OK, so how do I get this bound on the maximum root? It turns out I get it for free. Let me explain how. So there's a theorem of Godsell and Goodman which says that the expect, if I take an adjacency matrix and randomly sign the edges, the expected characteristic polynomial is 
the matching polynomial of the graph, where the matching polynomial is something else. I'll tell you about it in just a moment. But it is a known object. OK, that makes our life much easier. So what is the matching polynomial? This was defined by Heilman and Lieb. It counts the number of matchings in a graph with i edges. So its coefficients come from counting something. In particular, the coefficient of x to the n minus 2i is the number of matchings in the graph with i edges, where a matching is a subset of edges that don't touch any vertex twice. Let me give you an example. So here's a graph. Its matching polynomial is give you as x to the sixth minus 7x to the fourth plus 11x squared minus 2. Let's see why. The first coefficient of x to the sixth comes from there being exactly one matching with no edges, the empty matching, the trivial one. The coefficient of 7 comes from the seven edges. One edge by itself is a matching because it touches each vertex at most once. So 7 comes from 7 edges. OK, the interesting case, I think, is the 11. There are 11 matchings in this graph with two edges. Here they all are. So these are sets of two edges that only touch each vertex at most once. And there are two matchings with three edges. And that gets us our constant term. OK, so this theorem is so simple, I will prove it for you now. We can actually see exactly that the expected characteristic polynomial is the matching polynomial. <clears throat> to do that, let's compute the characteristic polynomial. Think of it as the determinant of xi minus the signed adjacency matrix. And now write the determinant as a sum, as we usually do, over, or one way, not the computationally efficient way, but one of the first ways we learn. We write it as a sum over all permutations of the product of the entries in a permutation. And then since it's a sum, the sum commutes with expectation. So I'm just going to compute the expectation of each of those products. So it's going to be yes. a question. How uh -huh. much do you avoid the, the trivial uh, eigenvalues? Oh, you mean, oh, so this is for the signed adjacency matrix. It doesn't have any trivial eigenvalues necessarily. Right. Good question. Right. It's only when they're all ones there that you get the trivial eigenvalues to pop up. OK, so one thing to remember when I'm computing this expectation is each edge appears twice in this matrix. And I have to give them the same sign. So to do this, right, you've got to make sure that these two you give the same sign, because they correspond to the same edge. And say these two you give the same sign. OK, so let's see what happens with our permutations. Which ones actually contribute? So if I take a look at a permutation, and it hits a 0 somewhere in here. You remember, you're taking the product of the entries, or the expected product. If you hit a 0, it contributes 0. So any permutation that hits really a non-edge in the matrix contributes 0. On the other hand, remember, each edge appears here twice. And if you hit it just once, you're also going to get a contribution of 0. There, let's say this edge we hit once because this permutation didn't include that one. The reason is because we're looking at the expected value of the product. And the expected value of any particular entry is 0. So you get it once with plus 1, once with minus 1, you get a product of 0. So the only terms that contribute are the ones that hit both copies of each edge when they hit edges. So if you have this entry, you have to have that one in the permutation. If you have this, you have to have that. Well, those are exactly the involutions. Those are the matchings. So this is how you see that, yes, when you are taking the expected characteristic polynomial, you get exactly the matching polynomial of a graph. Oh, yeah, here's another one. OK. So what was really miraculous to me is what Heilman and Lieb did with this polynomial. Because it was defined by counting things. Why should it have, why should there be anything good to say about such a polynomial? I had no intuition for that. I, I, I'm very curious as to why you thought this would, I don't know if you're willing to say on the record, what made you think these would be so nice? OK, sure. <laughs> so the first thing they prove is that all the roots are real, which is pretty amazing. OK, yes. OK, so those all land on a circle. Yes, OK. Um, they also proved that all the roots have absolute value at most 2 root d minus 1, 
OK, we're done with the two root d minus 1. See, I told you this came for free. I didn't have to do any work. They, they did it. Um, and the proof also is, is very slick and clean and easy for that. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Yes, but you still have to work to understand uh, it. And I have not done that work. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. There's, yeah, you can read that proof without any work. Exactly. I mean, that may be, yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, we don't need bipartite for any of this right now. No. No, bipartite is an artifact of the interlacing families technique that I'm using, which only allows me to reason about largest roots, but not smaller, but not largest and smallest together. OK, but so we already know that the maximum root of the expected characteristic polynomial is at most 2 root d minus 1. Yes. Yes. Terrific. Yes. Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. <coughs> mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so actually, I should actually emphasize another point that you just brought up, which is I'm talking about this polynomial. You can ask how hard is it to compute it? Because it's a sum over many, many, many things. Right. And the answer is Castellan's theorem tells you that in the planar case, at least, you can compute the constant term. But in general, this constant term is what we, the permanent of a matrix and is computationally very hard to compute. So we can't do big experiments for this. This constant term, yeah. Uh, I think, no, counting the number of matchings will come out to be, oh, OK, depends how you set it up, yes. But basically, we'll get a, something that we cannot efficiently compute, which is number of matchings in our graph. OK, so the question is, now that we know this, we need a way to reason that the lo, there is some polynomial in my family that I'm summing over whose largest root is at most this. Because just knowing anything about the roots of an average of polynomials usually doesn't tell you anything about the roots of the individual ones. OK, so this will be review for many of you, but I'll remind you anyway. So what we're going to look at is interlacing polynomials, where we, two polynomials interlace if when I write out their roots, the smallest root of one is smaller, is a mo yeah, is a most of the smallest root of the next, and then they alternate, and so on. So the classic example of this is thinking of a polynomial and its derivative, the roots interlace. Or if you look at the characteristic polynomial of a matrix and the characteristic polynomial of a submatrix that's just one size smaller, their roots will interlace. Well, we're going to, we yes. Yes, we're going to assume real roots. I do not know a nice analog of this for non-real roots, unfortunately. Um, I've been dreaming of one, but nothing I can define works yet. OK, so we're going to be interested in polynomials that have a common interlacing. This is when I have two polynomials, so these blue ones. And I've just drawn the roots of the polynomial that interlaces both of them in green. Uh, the important property of common interlacings is that you can divide the real line into intervals, basically cutting at these roots, so that each polynomial has exactly one root in each interval. And the important property of these, which I proved last lecture, is that when you have a fam two interlacing polynomials, one of them has a largest root that is at most the largest root of the average. So for these two, I've drawn the largest root of the average. You can see this one largest root is smaller. And that is important because we're trying to control the largest root. 
I mean, of course, I would really like to control both the largest and the smallest, but you can't control both simultaneously using only this fact. You could control one or the other. I have no idea how to control both. Oh, yeah, so I'm assuming the dominant term is positive. Thank you. That is very important. I usually make my polynomials monic, but certainly the, yeah, the largest, in order for this to be true, they have to go off to infinity. Okay, so now I can tell you what an interlacing family of polynomials are. They are a collection of polynomials that I can locate at the root leaves of a tree. So here are my polynomials, say, for a graph with just two edges. And then what I do at the intermediate nodes of the tree is I write down the average of the polynomials that appear beneath them in the tree. So at the root of the tree, I have the average of all the polynomials at all the leaves. We say these polynomials form an interlacing family if each pair of siblings has a common interlacing. And you need that to go everywhere up the tree. It doesn't have to be a nice regular tree like this. And there are times when we want to use different trees. But for now, we're going to have a, just a binary tree. I'm going to make write these polynomials more simply by just writing the in my case, you see what I've done is I've, say, fixed the first index and allowed the second to vary. So I'll just write the fixed indices for my polynomials. This is an easier way to label them. And this one will be the one at the root. And the key property is that there is always a leaf whose largest root is at most the largest root. Sorry. There's always a leaf whose largest zero is always at most the largest zero of the node at the top of the tree, the polynomial there. And that's just by common interlacing. Because you'll recall that these two have a common interlacing, and this is their average. So one of them has its largest root smaller than the largest root of this. And then you just walk down the tree, inductively applying this argument. So when you have an interlacing family, if you can bound, and by the way, there, interlacing families, once you start looking for them, appear in a lot of places in combinatorial constructions of polynomials. There are a lot of other ways of making polynomials by counting things. And a lot of them have real roots, and most of those you will find interlacing families in if you look in the right place. <coughs> yes? But for the numbers, mm. we look at the matching polynomials. Uh -huh. uh, all have even powers, right? Yes, they do. They have even powers, oh. and they're also symmetric. Did I? Yes, they do have. E I'm trying to remember. I may have stripped out the even powers and divided by two. I mean, divided all. I may have gotten rid of, uh, I may have just taken all of the odd terms. Actually, off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember. We don't need to, no. No, no, you don't need to. Right, but they all have these double roots, and then you know exactly where one root and the one one down is. Yeah, okay. but yeah. then hmm? the Right. But then don't you get symmetry about the origin or the root? Yes, you do. So but only, f the only for the node at the top. So for the average of all of them, oh, yeah, this one does have symmetry about the origin. You're exactly right. But once I go down to one of its children, I break that symmetry, and I lose that. Oh, yeah, so right. The, yeah, this one you know a lot. It's just when I go down, I can't control what happens to the roots as well. I can only control one end or the other. Okay, so now I need. Oh, yes, please. Huh? Oh, wait, did I say it backwards? I'm sorry. <clears throat> oh, you're right. Actually, oh, so you are right. When I get, oh, so my leaves here actually are the characteristic polynomials of the signed adjacency matrix. So I'm looking at the signed, which is not, oh, that is by part I do, and they are symmetric about the origin. Does that mean that the others along the way are symmetric about the origin? Um, yes, I guess that probably does, but that, or, but that, right, I see, but this only gets me something useful for the bipartite graphs. Again, that again is assuming by, oh, sorry, the question, yes. Oh. Oh. Oh, even powers. Oh, yes. OK, so right. One of the questions here is, what about getting non-bipartite Ramanujan graphs? You're right. So yes, when I take a graph, it doesn't need to be bipartite. The matching polynomial, the roots will be symmetric about the origin. But once I go down this tree, I break symmetry. So I can't get that further down. OK, so let's prove that this is an interlacing family of polynomials. <clears throat> So as I mentioned last lecture, there is an easy way to show that two polynomials have a common interlacing. It's to show that every convex combination of them is real rooted. If this is real rooted and that's real rooted and every convex combination is real rooted, that is 
if and only if condition for those two polynomials to have a common interlacing. So let's do that. So what is my interlacing family going to be? I'm going to fix the sign of the first k edges. It, the ordering doesn't matter. Just pick an ordering on them. I can imagine I put all of my all of my polynomials at the bottom, and the way that I collect them up is I put a subtree corresponding to fixing to the first sign to the first k edges and let the remaining ones be random. So those will correspond to my intermediate nodes in the tree. And to prove that two siblings have a common interlacing. Well, what happens with two siblings is I'm just, I fix the first k edge of signs. I'm just changing the sign of the next one, but not with probability a half. I'm making it probability lambda of being one and probability one minus lambda of being minus one. And I need to prove that that is a real rooted polynomial. So I think I spelled that out exactly what the expectation is. You can think of this as fixing the first signs, one sign is a skewed probability and the others are uniform. And gosh, I thought that proving that this was real rooted, I could do just by, if I could just understand Heilman and Lieb's theorem well enough and generalize it. And I was never able to prove this by generalizing your theorem on the real rootedness, which was very frustrating to me because there are many generalizations of their theorem that I think are true but that I don't know how to prove yet. Oh, but again, I have a lot of experimental evidence for it. So we needed a different way to prove that this was true. And what we do prove in the end is that whenever you have an expected characteristic polynomial like this, for every, as long as the distribution on the signs is independent, it doesn't matter what they are, but each sign needs to be chosen independently, you will always get a real rooted polynomial. <clears throat> and the way we do it is, well, by this method of mixed characteristic polynomials that I introduced last lecture. So for those who weren't here, or those who were, I'll just remind you, sorry, for those who were here, I'll remind you, basically what we call a mixed characteristic polynomial is when I have a collection of independently chosen random vectors, I take a look at the expected characteristic polynomial of the sum of their outer products. We call it a mixed characteristic polynomial. And we prove that those are always real rooted. So there's only one problem with applying this theory which is that the matrix I'm looking at right now isn't described that way. So I wanted each, I wanted a sum of independently chosen random vectors. That would mean that really for each edge I have to be adding say a rank one matrix or choosing a rank one matrix. But our matrix that we're getting is a sum of rank two matrices. When I take a look at an edge, when I'm trying to decide whether or not to sign it positively or negatively, I'm either putting in this edge or I'm putting in that edge. And their, their difference is rank two. Okay, so there is an easy fix for this. So this looks like an obstacle, it, it's not really. Just add to ones on the diagonal. And if you just add ones on the diagonal, for this edge, well, you can do it for all of the edges. You're just adding to the diagonal. And now this and that are both rank one matrices. So this means you are choosing either this outer product of a, the one one vector or the outer product of the one minus one vector for every single edge. And you're taking the sum of them. OK, and then the theory of mixed characteristic polynomials tells you that this expected characteristic polynomial is real rooted. <coughs> yes? Oh, just I put the zero, well, okay, so in the case of regular graphs, I'm just adding D times the identity to the diagonal, so I don't change real rootedness. Yeah, if here we use, so we actually we don't need to by another trick or two, but it's easier to think about regular. Yes, because right, this is literally adding D times the identity to the diagonal for the regular case. Okay, so this is our first generalization of Heilman and Lieb's theorem that whenever you have an expected characteristic polynomial with these signs, where each sign is chosen independently, but with whatever distribution you want, you do get a real rooted polynomial, and that implies our family is an interlacing family. <clears throat> and then, uh, good, I'm, I always like to finish my last talk early. We got about a few more minutes, but what this enabled, that we're basically almost done here. We can now conclude that there is a signing so that the maximum root is at most two root d minus one. And that really was the main theorem I was trying to prove. I mean, now I know 
that whenever you give me an adjacency matrix, it's deregular, I can always sign the edges so that the resulting matrix is all eigenvalues at most 2 root d minus 1. And that means if I take the corresponding 2 lift, I don't introduce any eigenvalues larger than 2 root d minus 1. And if it was bipartite, then I know the smallest eigenvalues at most minus 2 root d minus 1 that I've introduced. And your trivial eigenvalues only come from the base graph. All of the other lifts that you take don't contribute any trivial eigenvalues. So there is always a lift that is good. OK, so why don't I generalize this a little bit, tell you where the 2 root d minus 1 comes from, and tell you how we'll make, say, irregular Ramanujan graphs. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the universal cover of a graph. So that is just an infinite tree that maps down to the graph. So there's a map from the infinite tree to the graph, which maps vertices to vertices and edges to edges. And Every vertex, it has to be a homomorphism of its neighborhood on it. So for every vertex, you map its neighborhood to the neighborhood of the image. Um, one way that I like to describe this, and I think I learned from Avi's survey on expanders, was thinking of this of each node in the tree cor it corresponds to all the non-backtracking random, I mean, all the non-backtracking walks in the graph. A walk in a graph is where you start at a vertex, and you walk to a neighbor, and you walk to a neighbor, and you walk to a neighbor, and you never just go back just where you were. Later, you might hit an edge twice. But these naturally, if you just take non-backtracking walks, you're like pretending the graph is a large tree. And that's really what the tree corresponds to. Anyway, in the case of a deregular graph, the universal cover is the infinite Dieri tree. And really, what you can do is you can view the deregular Ramanujan graph as a quotient of an infinite Dieri tree. And it's a nice quotient. And you can check that the spectral radius of the infinite Dieri tree is 2 root d minus 1. So that is where the 2 root d minus 1 comes from. And actually, you can also argue that that is where Heilman and Lieb's 2 root d minus 1 comes from, if you look at it the right way for the matching polynomial. But to do that, I will tell you a different proof of their theorem due to Godsill. Or at least, you can think of it as a reinterpretation of their proof that's very combinatorial. So, what Godsill did is he took a graph and he looked at what he called the path tree of it, starting at a vertex. What is this? This is I started a vertex, and I'm going to make a node for every single walk, and I'll connect two of them together if one extends the next. Here's a picture. I start out with the graph I keep playing with. I'll make the path tree at node A. So first, the, take the trivial path that has no edges. Then there are two paths from A of length one edge, AE and AB. And then I connect them to the node that I call A in the tree. And then next, I can extend each of these by one. So Godsill's rule is that you do this tree, but you never include any vertex twice. So it is a finite tree. So not only do you not backtrack, but you never include any edge twice. So starting from any graph, you can build this path tree, and it's finite. And it is a subtree of the universal cover. It is a subgraph of that. And what he proved is that the matching polynomial of the graph divides the characteristic polynomial of the path tree. Okay, when you have a path tree, I mean, you take its characteristic polynomial, it's, of course, real rooted. So this tells you that the matching polynomial is real rooted. And also, if every eigenvalue of the matching polynomial must be an eigenvalue of the characteristic polynomial of this path tree. So if you have bounds on the eigenvalues of the path tree, then you get bounds on the eigenvalues of the matching, I mean, of the roots of the matching polynomial. <clears throat> OK. And of course, because the path tree of a deregular graph is um, is a subgraph of the infinite Dieri tree, and that has spectral radius at most 2 root d minus 1. This tells you that the matching polynomial, all of its roots, are at most 2 root d minus 1. Okay, but once you see this way of doing things, you realize you don't have to stick with regular graphs. You can take other graphs. So for example, you can take a look at a biregular int tree. So we want to view a CD biregular Ramanujan graph. It's if I have every node on one side is degree C and every node on the other side has degree D, then the universal cover of this is an infinite tree whose nodes alternate degree C and D at every other step. 
and its spectral radius is root d minus 1 plus root c minus 1. And that immediately tells you that the matching polynomial of the corresponding graph has all of its roots, at most root d minus 1 plus root c minus 1. And then you just pump through the exact same machinery. And you see, okay, there are an infinite family for every c and d of root d minus 1, root c, uh, I mean of bi cd by regular Ramanujan graph. So all your eigenvalues will be at most f. Um, Lubotsky asked us to point out that you, you can even make irregular, more irregular Ramanujan graphs. So Greenberg and Lubotsky defined a notion of what it means for some arbitrary graph to be Ramanujan. They said, look at its infinite, I mean, at its universal cover. And they'll say a graph is Ramanujan if all of its non-trivial eigenvalues, in this case, we'll say uh, non perron eigenvalues. The trivial ones here correspond to the eigenvalues of a constant, I mean, of a sine uniform, say all positive eigenvector. That gives you the trivial eigenvalues. They'll say a, a graph is Ramanujan if all of its non-trivial eigenvalues have absolute value less than the spectral radius of its universal cover. And again, applying exactly the same machinery, at least if G is a bipartite in Ramanujan graph, if you have any finite one, then you can construct an infinite family just using the exact same thing. Okay, so that's the last result I want to mention. Let me end with some open questions. The one that's been really driving me nuts is can we use anything like this technology to say there exist non-bipartite Ramanujan graphs of every degree? We want infinite families of them. And let me just mention that whenever you have a non-bipartite Ramanujan graph, you can make a bipartite Ramanujan graph on twice as many vertices. You take the lift in which all edges cross. So in some sense, the non-bipartite case is harder than the bipartite case. You can't go the other way around. You can't unwind a bipartite graph to get a non-bipartite Ramanujan graph. You can get within close, but not quite there. OK, so that's one thing we would really love to understand. And especially, I would like to understand it if there's any way of using this interlacing polynomial technique to get bounds on both roots. OK, you saw something like that yesterday when I proved the Cadison singer theorem. But that, doesn't, that proof I gave you was not tight. And therefore, you just know that it cannot get you Ramanujan graphs. Maybe if you tightened it up, you would. Efficient constructions. I mean, OK, so maybe that's not fair to ask as a question, because I'm trying to write a paper now that will at least get a polynomial time construction out of a related technique. So it's not the same thing as we can't compute permanence. But we do want to find efficient constructions, at least polynomial time the number of vertices of Ramanujan graphs of every degree. More importantly, can we get explicit constructions? Because I don't want to take time polynomial and n to build a Ramanujan graph of size n. For a lot of applications, like in a paper about solving large systems of linear equations that I'm writing with Richard Pang and Yin Tat Lee, we really need to take advantage of the fact, say, of Ramanujan graphs, that you can describe these incredibly efficiently, and that I can build one very quickly. Or all, if I know a neighbor, I can a node, I can generate its neighbors without having to think about the whole graph. And that's what we would really like to find for Ramanujan graphs of every degree. Thanks. Mm -hmm.